Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome back to the Fight Network Studios. This is Five Rounds. He's Robin Black. I'm a chunkier John Ramdean, and we have a ton of stuff to get to. We're answering your questions. We look at some of the action that went down when the UFC had their debut in Singapore. But we start with UFC 168, which went down in Sin City, as Anderson Silva looked to reclaim his title against the man who defeated him in July in Chris Weidman. And I think, Robin, going... Coming out of that first fight, people said, well, Anderson Silva was screwing around. I think now that he's refocused, he knows that uh, he can't do the same things that he did back in July. He's coming at Chris Weidman. But it seems that Chris Weidman just has his number as Anderson Silva sustained that a leg injury, broken leg. Chris Weidman checked it, and a lot of people are saying that uh, it was a fluke. You don't agree? No, absolutely not a fluke. I mean, what it was was a perfectly executed leg, uh, uh, leg kick check. And what that's intended to do is hurt you. In the first fight, Anderson Silva, the only real thing he had great success with was kicking the legs of Chris Weidman. So what is the game plan? What is Ray Longo working on with him? Check and kicks. And when you check kicks properly, you hurt a guy so bad he stops throwing kicks at you. It's part of the game plan. Well, he hurt him so bad he stopped throwing kicks for the next year. Uh, Chris Weidman, we talked about his mental confidence going into the first fight. It seemed to be tenfold yeah. in this fight, uh, in the rematch with Anderson Silva. And now Chris Weidman has clearly established himself as the best middleweight in the world. Are people interested in seeing a third fight between the All-American and the Brazilian Anderson Silva. Chris Weidman says, I feel bad if I have to fight this guy again. And I have to say, you know what? Mentally, he's going to have the edge because Anderson Silva's going to knock me out the first time. He destroyed my leg the second time. Uh, what do I do going into this third fight? Or is it even going to happen? Yeah, they, a million things would have to all happen simultaneously in an alternate universe to ever see the third fight. First of all, Anderson Silva, one of the greatest fighters of all time, he will leave a legacy that will possibly never be matched. Can he come back after 10 months of rehab and, you know, sitting there feeling that pain as his family sits on next to him saying, please don't fight anymore, starts to enjoy not having that pressure. Will he come back and fight? Maybe he will. We think he might, you know. Uh, this is what the guy does for a living. This is who he is. He's got to come back. Meanwhile, Chris Weidman has to prove that he's not just got Anderson Silva's number, but he is the elite best of the best. Maybe he will. Maybe that'll happen. But even with that, Silva would have to come back, beat other guys, and it just doesn't seem likely, and it doesn't seem really necessary. He's been beaten twice. Yeah, they were both odd, but, you know, Anderson Silva's an odd fighter. However you're going to beat him is going to be odd. Let's look at a couple of them. Weird knockout when he's clowning around, breaks his leg and a flying heel hook at the lat. These are three of his losses. This is how the man loses. He's a strange fighter. Strange wins sometimes. Strange losses. Anderson Silva did have emergency surgery. Everything is good. His surgeon said that not only will he make a full recovery, there is a chance that he could get back into the octagon sometime over the next year or so. Uh, do you think Anderson Silva is going to do that? I mean, you know, you're a fighter. Fighters like to fight. They feel the urge to get back it there and compete. George St. Pierre, I think, is going to get back inside of the cage. But Anderson Silva, we talked about the pressure of being a champion. Well, that pressure's off. Yeah. There's somebody now that holds his middleweight title, no longer his championship. I think the best thing for Anderson Silva is just go out and have some fights and adopt the same mentality that Rashad Evans and Vitor Belfort have. I'm a professional prize fighter. Yeah, you know what? I, I want to fight. I only dedicated five or six years of my life to trying to fight, and I'm not all that good at it, and I still want to do it. Imagine being the greatest fighter in the world. This is defined who this man is. When he ate, when he slept, what he did with every minute of his life was all built around this goal, and that goal is suddenly gone for a year. It's going to make him hungry. It's going to make him desperate to, to, get, to do it again. He's already talking about it, and you are absolutely right. Even though you have to come back from an injury, in a weird kind of way, it's a new achievable goal. For Silva, there's not the pressure of defending this belt and of being, you know, defined as the greatest fighter of all, all time. All you got to do is come back, heal yourself, rehab it, and get into the cage, and it's a victory. And that's a victory I think this guy will want. But we can't stop talking about Chris Weidman. Yes, yeah. Silva's one of the greatest of all time. Yes, we got to talk about whether he'll be back. But Chris Weidman did the unthinkable and finished him two times. Now he's got to look at Vitor Belfort. And very quickly, Weidman has three huge things. He has that unshakable true real confidence he has an incredible work ethic and he has the ability to learn 
Add to it some great coaching and some belief in that coaching, and you have a guy who it looks like could beat anybody at 185 pounds. Vitor Belfort also firing on all cylinders right now. Had a banner 2013. Uh, Chris Weidman has had a couple of comments saying that TRT Belfort is simply unfair. He doesn't feel that he should able he, he should have all these exemptions because he's not only is he winning, he's absolutely wrecking guys. And for Chris Weidman, he's a guy that you know. Come on, everything should be on a on a fair level playing field yeah and and that's going to be a part of the conversation and they'll let that be a part of the conversation but by the time this is really going to happen it's going to happen in vegas or wherever why or july yeah weidman's new focus is going to be let's just beat this guy let's not lay out excuses that unshakable confidence is real and two this is a very different fight but there's a couple of key elements that he had through the anderson silva era of those two fights that are going to be important now one is that very same confidence you got to go in there you can't fear this guy and the other is a willingness to fight him on the feet other guys approach Silva with let's get it let's take him down we're better wrestlers we're better on the ground let's do that being willing to fight him on the feet hurt him on the feet and then allow the takedown to happen when it happens that strategy worked really well for him and that'll be a key strategy when he fights Belfort I as think well. the problem though is Vitor Belfort seems to have that confidence that Chris Weidman has just Really a guy that's willing to get in there, knocked out Dan Henderson, took out Luke Rockhold and Michael Bisping. And you have to, he's training with guys like Rashad Evans, Tyrone Spong, and just training with training partners of that caliber mm. is going to give you confidence. Yeah, and here's a talking point you don't hear a lot about TRT, but suddenly you will after we mention it here today. But confidence is built in youth. And when you fight a 19-year-old, he truly believes there's no way you can beat him. His testosterone levels are at this growing, surging, powerful level. And when you take a 38-year-old and you add the confidence of a 19-year-old and you add 20 years of building their body like a 19-year-old, you do get a very dangerous animal. And that confidence in Vitor Belfort, it's something people aware of TRT, people at the UFC level. One of the reasons they don't like it is because what it does for your confidence in your ability to perform. And that's going to be an interesting talking point, too. We got to talk about the co feature Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate. Uh, some great smack talk leading up to this fight. Uh, Misha Tate believed she, you know, the first fight was all based on emotion. She made a few errors. She said that wasn't going to happen in this fight. She looked outstanding, really did a great job. Unfortunately for Misha Tate, got submitted in that third round. Uh, Ronda Rousey just seems to be on a different level, throwing her at will. And I think a lot of people were surprised that Misha Tate engaged her instead of trying to stay on the outside and utilize her boxing. But instead, she tried to get into the danger zone. And she said one of the reasons why is because she was just not afraid yeah. of Rousey's ground game. And you have to have confidence. We saw it with Chris Weidman. Yeah. And I thought that Misha Tate needed to have the confidence. And she displayed that. Yeah, she did. It it was an interesting one. You can, you can see it in retrospect. You're right. People are like, why would she even tangle with her? And you even saw it on Twitter with pro fighters excitedly watching at the time. But in retrospect, if it went well, part of it of mixing it up, of making Ronda Rousey fear some ground and pound, taking her to the ground and showing her, you're not going to armbar me. I'm going to stay centered. I'm going to use my hips to take away your armbar. I'm going to punch you a few times. Make her fear that will open up the striking. Didn't work out that way, unfortunately, because whether it was an underestimation or Rousey's ability to perform at the highest level under pressure, Rousey cannot be messed with on the ground, and she cannot be messed with in the clinch, man. The, you know, and you look at Tate, she has that body lock to the outside trip you, you want to use. That inside throw, that inside hip throw that she used, man, it's like... Anybody who watched that fight now, and that includes McMahon, has to look and go, man, to take someone down, you have to get into that clinch territory. If you get into that clinch with Ronda Rousey, you go for a ride, man. And the, the good thing about it, it was a win-win situation for the women's bantamweight division as well as the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Everybody saw that you have a dominant champion in Ronda Rousey, and you also have a star in Misha Tate. So there's a lot of fights you can sell with Misha Tate. A fight with Alexis Davis, I think, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I think a rematch match with Sarah Kaufman makes sense. Yeah. She's well, a star now. Exactly. She's a star and I think that's what they need. The women's division isn't just about one fighter. I yeah. think there's a lot of room for a lot of stars and I think McMahon, Sarah McMahon, we know that Ronda Rousey's going to be facing her next at UFC 170. I think she all she has to do is have the same type of performance that Misha Tate had and she'll be a star as well. Yeah, people are starting to like the women's fighting and, and another reason for it, whether you see it specifically or you just kind of sense it, is 
there is parity in men's fighting. We're all training with the same guys, the same types of coaching. You know, yes, there's a little bit of research. We're, gonna, we're starting to see it in leg kicks a little bit with Safadine and suddenly Anderson Silva breaking his leg. That's gonna be something you'll see played with a little more this year. But generally speaking, there's a lot of parity. But in women's fighting, not only is Ronda Rousey so incredibly dominant o over everybody, everybody else has to figure out where the pecking order is and where they shake out because they're not gonna go in and be very similar, good everywhere. Some uh, girls are gonna beat some other girls in interesting areas. You may see more finishes than we used to in women's fighting because now it's at the highest level and there is a discrepancy in their skill levels. And that little throwback of, of fighters not being all the same really raises the excitement level. And I think another reason why is because Ronda Rousey is just so polarizing. You and I were watching the fight with your boxing coach, Billy Martin, and he was losing <laughs> his mind how much he hated yeah, Ronda Rousey. And I think when you can get martial arts coaches yeah. to feel emotionally invested and say, oh, I hate this fighter, yeah. I think she's doing her job. Absolutely. I mean, it, this is an exciting time to be watching fighting. There's more and more fighting. Yes, we're going to have to filter through a lot of low level stuff with fight pass and stuff maybe we'll talk about that in, in, in the next uh, bit a little bit but uh, at the highest level not only do we have the best fighters in the world performing we have you know a, a arms race of training and coaches and knowledge out there but we also have that passion being built up in the fights you're right you get coaches and fighters in a room having a beer screaming at the television set <laughs> because one of these fighters has either irritated them or excited them that much that's good times we also got to talk about the heavyweight matchup between my guy Josh Barnett who I thought you know would take this fight down to the ground take Travis Brown down utilize his submission game but Travis Brown proved that you know what Cain Velasquez I'm coming for your title man did this guy ever look good yeah he really does look good and it's really cool when you're seeing that's two that's two times he has put a guy who's shooting for that double to the side and caved him in like that that is one little pocket that doesn't mean that means you got to watch out when you take him down which means now you got to stand with him and he's developing stuff like that uh, for that game that Al, uh, like Alistair Overeem learned so you can really change the shape of all your future fights by making it too dangerous to do something on you and I think Travis Brown did that when we come back to five rounds, we take a look at the UFC's first foray into Singapore. Welcome back to Five Rounds. This past Saturday, the UFC went to Southeast Asia for Fight Night 34, which featured the main event, a welterweight tussle between Tarek Safadine and Hyungyu Lim of South Korea. It ended up being fight of the night. And I think a lot of people were surprised at this, how exciting this fight was. Not a lot of people knew who Lim was. It was a middleweight who was coming down to 170 pounds, looked oh. absolutely monstrous against the former Strike Force champion who stuck with his game plan, absolutely brutalized the legs of Lim, who fell a number of times because of those leg kicks, but he was always in it. Even at almost at the end of the fight, he came at Safadim and tried to end this fight. You ever hear though that uh, expression, there are no losers in this fight? Well, that's nonsense, <laughs> but at the same time, sometimes you don't lose quite as bad. Yes, today, Lim cannot walk. It is probably a total fiasco down there at his legs of all kinds of color and pain and clotting. He's in a wheelchair, but he didn't lose in the sense, no, he lost, yeah. but he didn't lose in the sense that fans love a yeah. guy like this. They love a guy who in round five of a fight you're clearly losing, still comes in there roaring and looking for the finish. He really, really performed well, but Safadine is somebody to watch at 170 pounds. You know, we looked at Anderson Silva breaking his leg on a beautiful, perfectly executed leg check, uh, check by Chris Weidman. You, I don't know if you're gonna be able to check Safadine's kicks because he's operating at a higher level. We saw boxing take to the forefront in the development of striking in MMA in sort of 2011, 2012, you're going to see low kicks being an important thing now as guys are starting to see that you can put them back in, you can defend the takedown better and use them. Safadine uses them like a superhero, wears your legs down, smashes them, economical, he doesn't show them, just smashes, smashes your legs, gets in, hurts you and gets out, has a really, really high yeah. guard, so he forces you to try to engage him, and if you, if you forget about his legs because his hands are so high, he'll tenderize you. He's a really, really special fighter. The 27-year-old uh, Belgian, the thing that makes him 
so impressive is that he came into mixed martial arts as a stand-up fighter, now calls Team Quest home, really an underrated ground game, some outstanding wrestling, uh, and I, I think this is a guy to watch out for. But one thing you have to ask is in that fourth round, his coaches are saying, go after him. Yeah. You can take this guy out. And it seemed to the viewers at home that he could. Why could he not pull the trigger? Is it simply the fact that it was a five-round fight and he was exhausted? You throw everything yeah. you possibly can at your opponent and he refuses to go down. That has to take some of your momentum away. Yeah, I think he's too smart to make the mistake of going in and going, man, if I really try to finish him and I don't, I'm gonna get knocked out in the fifth. I won't be able to hold my hands up, I won't be able to move. He went in, kinda tried, and had to go in and check himself to not commit and lose everything, and he did a great job of it. But what I do find interesting, you take a world-class kickboxer, he doesn't go to a kickboxing gym, he goes to Team Quest, one of the best wrestling gyms in history, very smart. Uh, one of the best Japanese mixed martial arts wrestlers out there, Tatsuya Kawajiri, for years, uh, he was fighting outside of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. We're saying, why is this yeah. guy not fighting in the UFC? Well, in Singapore, he made his debut against the undefeated Sean Soriano from the Black Zillions, who looked phenomenal yeah. in the early goings of this fight, taking it to the Japanese fighter. But Kawajiri proving that he has those veteran skills, yeah. those, those wily abilities, was able to weather that storm, used his wrestling to take this fight down to the ground, dished out some serious punishment, and in round number two, secured the submission victory. Tatsuya Kawajiri. How do you? Uh, how did you like his performance overall? I thought it was great because Soriano was relentless, 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 and uh, the only mistake, if that you can call it that, was trying to test the crusher with that because he's the most relentless yeah. of all. You can't just will him to be done. You have to go in and make it happen. Kawajiri looked phenomenal, and the way, really, as great a performance as he had, the, his performance on the mic exciting <laughs> the crowd was probably even better. I love America. Buddy, you were in Singapore. Get it right. Anyways, Love Kawajiri it. was not the only Japanese fighter to be making his UFC debut. Former deep lightweight champion Katsunori Kakuno also looked impressive, taking out Quinn Mulhern. As a matter of fact, sent him into retirement. Yeah, Mulhern decided that maybe he couldn't uh, perform at this level. And, you know, who are we to judge? If that's, that's what you choose, move on. Uh, good luck in your future. But, uh, you know, Kakuno in this one caused Mulhern to hesitate. So it wasn't as exciting a fight, although he's a very interesting fighter. I want to show people what you can expect from him in, the, him in the future by taking a look back at some of his greatest hits. This is a really interesting fighter. Look at this dude. He's going to a karate tournament right here. Jocelyn's Karate Tournament in Hamilton, Ontario. No, he's fighting. And check it out. He wants to draw punches out of you and slip his head there and counter. That's the game. Your hands are low. You're saying, throw punches at me. My head won't be there. Or kicks. And look how nice that is. Slips this kick out of the way and answer. Traditional martial arts technique used perfectly in a cage, or in this case, in a ring. And drawing out the punches to be able to answer. Very simple process in theory, but he is better at it than you are, and he's going to make you pay. And if you will not strike with him, he's going to kick your legs, and that will cause you to have to either enter or kick with him yourself. And you see what happens as you enter, you get hit, and he comes and attacks you. This is a very talented guy. Watch him make you flinch, and he's still going to drive those kicks into your legs. What's that going to do? Well, it's either going to hypnotize you, make you kick back, or make you attack him inside. But look what happens if you don't think and you're not safe and he tricks you here one step back back oh ow boom right to the head we got to see that one again watch as he causes you to come forward by stepping back loads that back left leg and delivers it to the chin crack that is nasty and he uses this kick throughout that left leg of his is incredibly powerful look the step forward this time we'll see it again there with the kick to the body you see this a number of times I want to see it one more time after this one to the body and he will finish with punches and you are gonna be out and he's done this one more than once watch step left to the the body right punch to the face and oh man you are done you want to see it one more time and this one maybe get the kids out of the room because this one is nasty steps in finishes you to the liver hey the ref doesn't want to stop it well no problem hey you can't do this in the UFC and damn good thing for those 155 pounders out there this dude is scary he's also a little crazy flying capo kick no problem this guy has some kooky karate you got to keep an eye on Kakuno man he's gonna be a lot of fun to watch in the UFC and Robin when you think about some of the matches
matchups the UFC could potentially put together. John McDessie or Anthony and Jukawani, just some crazy styles. And that uh, Goju-Ru karate style of Katsunori Kakuno, very interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. And what I loved when I was breaking him down and looking back through all these, early in his MMA career, he actually fought with his hands up, got away from his traditional style, went and did that for a bit, and then thought, you know what? I'm so comfortable in what I spend a lifetime doing. He, he fights with that karate style. It's going to be very interesting to watch how he does. When we come back to five rounds, we answer your Twitter questions. Welcome back to Five Rounds. Ram Dean and Black with you, and it is time to get to my favorite segment where we answer your questions. The first question comes to us at Cheap Gas Band. Are fighters who wear glasses allowed to wear contacts in the cage? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I fought at the very lowest level of mixed martial arts, and I couldn't find an answer for this, and I wore glasses. So I just wore the contacts. And in fight number one, I got a circular cut around my eyeball in the shape of a contact. Fought all the way through to fight number eight. When the re ref came in right before and looked, he said, are you wearing contacts? I'm like, yeah. He runs back, checks with the doctor, comes back and says, go ahead. One of them goes into my eye again and cuts it. I end up taking out on a stretcher, and I got laser eye surgery. Holy smokes. You'd figure that this is, uh, this is an issue that the commission would definitely deal with considering uh, half of the people on the planet wear glasses. Well, I know that lower level fights are much different than at the highest level, but nobody really seemed to care too much one way or the other. Very strange. Uh, question number two, Yas the Boss, what do you think about the direction of the welterweight division in the Ultimate Fighting Championship? And for me, I think it's a very exciting time. Of course, George St. Pierre taking a sabbatical from mixed martial arts competition. We have Johnny Hendricks taking on Robbie Lawler, and you got to love that fight. And I'm going to call it for the interim title. But you look at the fight between, uh, you have Rory McDonald taking on Damian Maia. Yeah, yeah. You have uh, Hector Lombard taking on Jake Shields. And then you look at some of the prospects right now in the welterweight division. I think it's an exciting time for 170 pounds. Yeah, man, I'm excited about the young guys. You got your Gunnar Nelsons and your Steven Thompsons and your Jordan Means and your Brandon Thatch. That's exciting. I've never heard anyone call George St. Pierre's break a sabbatical, but I do like it. I have to, uh, come on. Just like Anderson Silva, we know Anderson Silva injured himself. He says he wants to get back in the cage. George St. Pierre just wants some time off to do normal people things. Uh, you had the desire. You still have the desire to get back in there and duke Everybody, it out. Every fighter does, George St. Pierre, every one of the greatest, if not the greatest fighters of all time, will definitely want to get back inside of the cage. On that note, on behalf of Mr. Robin Black and our entire Fight Network crew, I'm John Ramdean saying so long for now. We'll see you next time on Five Rounds.